You give one set of nationalists a by-election bloody nose, and then some more crop up the next week. Welcome to the Lib Dem podcast. Hello and welcome to the Lib Dem podcast. My name is John Potter. I am the leader of the Preston Lib Dems and a Lancashire County Councillor. And with me today on this voyage of liberalism, we have one of our regulars. We have David McKenzie, a, a Scot in, in glorious, uh, what would you call it, isolation probably in Tamworth? Maybe exile. not, David, but, but yeah, exile. That's the one. How are you doing, David McKenzie? Very well, thank you, John. Looking forward to this episode and looking forward to speaking to Alex. And of course, he's, as David just alluded, we have... Of course, maybe I should have started with you, Alex, instead of David. But I don't, I don't know if there's a hierarchy going on it's here. But we're, we're brilliant to be joined by friend of the podcast, the leader of the Scottish Lib Dems, Alex Cole Hamilton. Welcome back, Alex. Hi, guys. Great to be here. So, not much going on in Scotland. Any news this week, no, David? Quiet and Alex? week. It's been a quiet week. Same old, same old. Plus a change. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I say that uh, tongue in cheek, but actually, you know, this is the seventh restart. I think somebody worked it out. It's seventh time lucky was the headline in the Courier, the Dundee Courier this week. When, of course, Nicola Sturgeon finally announced her gambit, her pathway to deliver her pledge to her voters of having a referendum in 2023. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll come across and, and explore what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, David, I mean, we've been expecting this for some time, but mm -hmm. uh, do you want to just go on about exactly what was announced and why Nicola's done it? Yeah, so effectively what the Scottish National Party and Nicola Sturgeon have announced as of this week is that they are effectively looking to hold a referendum in 2023. They have several different iterations or plan A, plan B, plan C, probably all the way down to plan Z about what they are going to do to get that referendum. Um, now, obviously, the first one is, is they will seek to get a Section 30 order from the UK government to hold a referendum. There's obviously concerns from people that they might plan to hold a referendum without the consent of the UK government, akin somewhat to what happened in uh, Catalan uh, a few years back when they held an illegal referendum. Um, they've also announced that there's a potential that if they don't get the ability to hold that referendum in September 2023, that they will then use the 2024 general election as a proxy referendum uh, on the issue of Scottish independence, which has immediately hit roadblocks because we've had uh, public policy experts and professors and academics who have said that it is not down to a political party to decide if a general election is to be used as a proxy referendum. They are two completely separate things. So that's what's been put on the table by the Scottish National Party. Again, we're in a position where you know, how many years are we on now from 2014? And this issue continues to roll on when we have so many issues that we have to talk about in Scotland, which I'm sure Alex and I will dive into. But I think the first thing to note is that because of that announcement that Nicola gave, they delayed the conversation in the Scottish Parliament about Scotland's drug deaths. Now, to me, that is completely unforgivable because you're taking your eye off the ball yet again. So Alex, I'd be keen to get what your thoughts were on Nicola's announcement and really where this leaves Scotland as a whole? Well, there's quite a lot to unpack there, David, but you've done, you've summarised it very succinctly. Um, I think that what, what was striking um, to everybody, and I think probably wrong-footed everybody, was this, uh, this um, device that she's employed to actually head off the very likely legal, the um, absolutely inescapable legal challenge that would have come had they just announced a uh, a declarator referendum, a, a, an opinion poll referendum, where they're just sort of um, taking the temperature of the Scottish public um, by going to the Supreme Court themselves. Now, I think there's a subtext to this, and people missed, um, I think, quite widely, the fact that Jackie Bailey um, issued a point of order at the end of the proceeding um, asking why the Lord Advocate wasn't in the chamber and why... Um, if the Lord Advocate has been instructed by the government to um, make a reference to the Supreme Court when she will be um, available to, to be questioned. And that's really key. And it's I think it's, it gives the lie to this. And I think that actually, you know, the Lord Advocate cannot um, act on illegal instructions or cannot give the government a bogus legal advice. And she's there to give um, legal advice in the foothills of any legislation to say if it's within the competence of the parliament. I think everybody's guess is now that the Lord Advocate said, First Minister, this is not competent, this is not legal. And then the First Minister, you know, don't, fearing that she might not even get to the races, not, might not even get to announce this, 
said, well, what can we do? Let's go and just check that with the Supreme Court. And everybody you listen to says that the Supreme Court will say, no, this isn't in the competence. If we look at the founding fathers of devolution and um, what they, they said about the Scotland Act, they, they said that anything that hinted at passing legislation with any reference to a reserved matter would be incompetent. So even if this didn't have an effect, because it's it's sort of pointing at a reserved power, um, it's not within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. So I, I think that's the first thing is that, I, that this is, um, the game's a bogey for Nicola in terms of trying to just do this. She's gonna have to have this fight in court. Hello, John from the Lib Dem podcast here. We are delighted to say that this episode is sponsored by Prater Reigns. Now more than ever, you need a professional-looking online presence and website. Prater Reigns have been helping Liberal Democrat campaigns succeed for 18 years. Their Lib Dem Foci package combines a website, social media and email system to help Lib Dems win. You'll receive great support from real people, fair pricing and a huge range of features to choose from. Prater Reigns are already the bespoke developers for Lighthouse, Lib Dem Draw Online and the LD Directory. They combine a talented system design with an unrivaled understanding of our party, our data and our systems. To find out more, check out the Prater Reigns website at praterreigns.co.uk slash liberal dash democrats. You called it, Alex, uh, a, an appalling waste of energy and focus, and we've talked about some of the issues. But do we actually, does anyone in the room actually think this is about Scottish independence at all? Or is this just covering up other issues and wanting something to fight about at the next general election? Well, if I could just make a quick point there, John, and I think Alex will agree with me here, this is purely designed to have something in 2024 to fight a general election on that does not focus on their record in government. They don't want to talk about failing education. They don't want to talk about failing health service. They don't want to talk about their disastrous response to the COVID-19 pandemic. They don't want to talk about the fact they can't build two bloody ferries to support the island communities. It is all designed to completely take the eye off of that and focus on everybody needs to get around us because we are the indie movement. That's 100 percent accurate. Um, Dave is right. There are warning lights blinking across the dashboard of public policy in Scotland right now. You know, we have um, some of the longest uh, cancer care waits that we've had in the history of the NHS. Um, if your child fell off her bike and broke her arm, she'd be in plaster by the end of the day. But if she came to you with self-harming behavior or um, a depression, she joins the longest queue in the National Health Service, two years for first line assessment in child and adolescent mental health services. We have the worst drug deaths in the whole world in Scotland. That's that. I mean, that's a statistical fact. Um, and all of this um, is is just caused by, in large part, ministerial disinterest, because every minister in that cabinet, in the wider government, is focused on the prize of independence. Nicola Sturgeon has been boxed in um, with this um, notional uh, mandate that she claims. We could discuss whether she's got a mandate or not. Um, I have questions about that. But um, but she's got that, that pressure to deliver for her base Um, And then the legal realities that we've already um, hinted at in terms of the Section 30 order about whether you could have a a meaningful referendum. And the one thing I would give credit to Nicola Sturgeon for is that she is cautious and does not want to do something that will not be legitimately recognised in the international community. So I think she's always ruled out that kind of wildcat referendum. Um, And and so, yeah, but David's absolutely right. This is a smokescreen. It's red meat to the base. And, and this is all from a first minister that I think is by and large both ran out of steam and ran out of road. She is also looking for an exit strategy. And I think by saying if um, we need to get 50 percent at the general election, we're just going to make it all about this one line in our manifesto on independence. Um, if she doesn't get that, I think she'd very likely resign the office of first minister the very next day. I suppose the, the next obvious question is why now? And I have a kind of a, a, a belief in my head is that. In the assumption that previously that the Tories looked like there would be a very strong uh, chance they would have a majority again at the next general election, and then since Partygate, fantastic by-election results, and now the polling seems to suggest that it'll be a hung parliament, and actually that's a lot harder for the for the Scottish Nationals to fight there. You know, you're saying you're going to be stuck with the Tories forever. That's a really nice message for them to have. Yeah. And if that's now changed, is that the reason why she's gone now? Because she wants to draw these battle lines up now. 
Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, if you think about the weather in which you would choose to fight a, an independence referendum if you were on the yes side, you wouldn't pick a, a, a more fertile time than this. If you think Brexit is still raw, we're still seeing the, the aftermath, the aftershocks around the Good Friday Agreement, the, the fact that we are have the worst performing economy in Europe because of Brexit. Um, you've got Boris Johnson, party gate. Um, Nicola's perceived competence in handling the pandemic, although I agree with David, I think that's misplaced. Um, and so all of this, um, you know, you're never going to have a more fertile time. You're never going to have a stronger grief response from Remainers who might believe the lie that Scotland could find its way back into the EU quite easily. And I hope we come on to that because that is a lie. Um, and, and so, yes, it, uh, th there would be no better time to do it. And if they don't make it this time, I firmly believe they won't because they're not going to get the referendum and they won't get 50 percent of the general election. And um, this potentially puts it to bed for a long time to come. So if that's the case, David, why do it? Well, look, ultimately, as Alex has kind of talked about there, there becomes a point where the base starts to get tetchy about when are we going to move on this. And I think it's been speculated for some time that there's many people within the SNP that have been looking at what's the future for Nicola, who's the sort of prospective next first minister. She's surrounded herself with people who... Uh, encapsulate her power base but that's you know we've seen it before with a lot of political parties that doesn't last forever but I think ultimately you know the SNP entered into a coalition agreement this time with the Greens there was an understanding from the Greens that there would be a move towards having a second independence referendum but what I think Alex and I would like to talk about is that what was very peculiar and almost funny is that this announcement was not made aware to the Green Party before uh, Nicola stood up and, and announced it and Lorna Slater you know uh, for, for all her failings um, you know I, I wouldn't like to have been in her position where she was getting asked questions and knew absolutely nothing about it so mm. Alex I mean to me it seems like that that's really what we're at is that they made an agreement she's probably looking at if I don't do something soon people are going to start to question when I am going to do it and uh, and again take the heat off some of the other things that they're failing at. Absolutely. Um, and just on the Greens, I mean, it, it says a lot about this coalition or the I can't believe it's not a coalition coalition um, <laughs> between the Greens and the SNP um, that at its centrepiece, you do not have the climate emergency. You have this the breakup of the United Kingdom. Um, and and I it was a it was just a real moment for me. I was uh, just minutes after Nicola Sturgeon sat down from her announcement on Tuesday, Lorna Slater and I ran to the media tower and sat in the same studio on live Scottish radio to talk about the implications of what had been announced. And she was thunderstruck. You could see that she was absolutely spinning. Um, I mean, first of all, she said, well, of course, you know, we have a duty to deliver the centrepiece of our manifesto. And I said, well, I can't believe I'm sat opposite a Green Party MSP who's saying that the centrepiece of her manifesto is not the existential threat that the climate emergency represents. Yeah. So it just goes to show if you want a party that will fight the climate emergency ferociously, you've got to go for the Lib Dems because the Greens have abandoned you. Um, and further, and then John Beatty, who's the BBC Scotland producer, said, so, so when did you hear about this? And Lorna's silent. And he said, so, but you've got sight of this before she stood up and say, oh, obviously the First Minister has to keep confidentiality sacrosanct. So you didn't hear about it then, <laughs> silence. You didn't hear about it then, silence. And I, I literally spontaneously just went, wow, this is amazing. You know, you've got, what kind of a partnership is this? And actually it's really interesting because the, I think that the sort of terror in Lorna Slater's face, and it was terror, um, is the realisation that if the SNP go all in on a general election and try to cast it as a, um, an independence referendum. And David's right, legally, you can't do that. But if they, if all they talk about is you've got to vote for the SNP to give us, um, to show that there's 50% of the people want independence, where does that leave the Greens or Alipa, other independent supporting parties? It just, I, I think there's a good chance they get absolutely swallowed up by the SNP at that election. Mm. So shall we just game this out almost in a sense? Because the... the She's called for a referendum. It's not going to happen. There's no way it's going to be allowed. So what, so is then, it's just the kind of, so what happened? Because it's October 19th next year. So she's going to obviously play the kind of, it's Westminster against us kind of card. That's, but then how does that work out in terms of, I'm also thinking from the, the wider general election point of view, what, what will the Tories use with this? Because will they then go into that election? And I'm conscious 
I want us to talk about how Lib Dems on the ground deal with this issue because it is it's gonna it is gonna be an issue at the next section as much as we don't want it to be, or we might think it's a distraction. How then Lib Dems get because the Tories will say, if you want to save the union, vote Tory. I mean, I imagine that they'll also do the you know little Keir Starmer in Nicola's pocket kind of thing in England. I think it actually helps the Tories in some ways in the general election, what Nicola's doing. Um, how does that then work next? I don't know who wants to go first. We'll go Alex, you can go first. And that. So how does that game out in terms of... Yeah, so so I had, um, you know, we're a membership-led party, John, so I was very keen that we had an all-member Zoom while everyone was invited. And we had, and it was our most successful online meeting outside of a conference. There were hundreds of people there. Um, and it was at 10 o'clock at night. It was after mm-hmm. Parliament finished. So um, uh, just to discuss what our response as a party. Um, uh, and I, I think that the membership were very, very clear that they uh, feel, as I do, that the Tories are now absolutely part of the problem and that actually there is, um, there's a real anxiety about any association with some kind of Tory campaign to make the case for the union. Because yeah. if, if it's a case of the Tory vision of Britain versus Nicola's vision of independence, then we're stuffed. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, I, I've been saying since I was made leader of the party in August um, that I'm, I'm tired of this clash of nationalisms, by which I mean the nationalism of the SNP, of course, but the, the British Brexit nationalism mm. of, of Boris Johnson's Tory party. English nationalism. Yeah. English nationalism. We, we are a nation trapped between flags, between politicians who mythologize and pine for ancient nations that can and never should exist again. It cannot and never should exist again. Um, and it's it's the dimin- it diminishes public debate. Um, so, yeah, we, we're very keen um, to to work with um, other actors and stakeholders who share our values for a reformed and federal United Kingdom. Um, but but I think that the, the Tories need to realise that if if we have to have a discussion about independence, that's more likely in a general election than anywhere else, that they sit it out, frankly. Mm. But they won't do that, will they, David? No, I mean, ultimately, I think there is going to be a, a real tough point for the remaining Tories that are in Scotland um, about how they actually equate what's happening with their government and the fact that Douglas Ross has sort of in a weird way, I mean, I call it the hokey-cokey, one minute he was in on Boris Johnson, the next minute he was out, then he was in again, and now he's out again. So how he could effectively stand on a platform and say, I back Boris Johnson to be the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom moving forward, and you've got to back me to deliver on that, he can't, because he's been saying again and again that he doesn't believe that he should remain as Prime Minister. So I think it all really depends. And There's a long way to go yet until we get to the next general election, whether the incumbent prime minister is said prime minister will, I think, be a big factor uh, on what happens in that general election. But I think Alex is absolutely right. Look, you know, I was part of the Better Together campaign. I campaigned vigorously with Better Together. Um, I think the problem that we will have is that this Tory party, as it stands currently, is a very different beast from what was around in 2014. There's no competence within that party there's no believability there's no truth there's no um public perception of uh, you know loyalty to the public who put them in place so i think alex is absolutely right we we need to disassociate ourselves from the conservatives um i don't think our vision of what a future united kingdom would look like has anywhere in common with what they believe uh, and I think it's down really to the Liberal Democrats to make that case of what a reformed federal Britain changed with a new constitution with more power, not only to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but also to parts of the English regions would look like and how that will deliver better for people and ultimately raise the standard of living within this country. I mean, because, uh, sorry, go, go on, Alex. No, I'm just going to say, and I can I can sort of um, quietly announce on this podcast that I have already started. We're in the early stages of starting planning a national tour of public meetings to make that case, and we're going to start in the summer in my constituency. Um, and it's about that positive sunshine cam- uh, campaign for. It's not a campaign because we're not in a referendum, but I think it's it's certainly what people are talking about. And um, and I, I want to pick up the challenge of making that positive case for Scotland's retained membership of a reformed federal United Kingdom um, and talking about the also giving 
people in local communities the opportunity to talk about the priorities that match them on mental health on um drugs on uh, the healthcare emergency all of these things um because i think we need to raise that standard of public debate beyond that and just to, if i could finish by saying um i met for the first time I was, at, I was at the queen's garden party very grand um this week and i met um alistair jack for the first time who's secretary for state for scotland my goodness um, I've met him for five minutes. If that man has anything to do with our campaign <laughs> to save the UK, we are stuffed. I mean, we, we just <laughs> underscored how far removed the Tories have to be from making that case because, I mean, they, they won't be able to help themselves, um, but we can we can walk in step with other parties. I've got good relationships with the Nasawa up here. We speak the same language on that progressive federal UK. Um, but we need to ostracise the Tories here because they are a liability. But, but the Tories have got nothing to lose. So the Tories, for, for all our uh, listeners and viewers out there, the Tories have six MPs in Scotland, mainly around, they've got Dumfrieshire, but also in West Aberdeenshire, I think. things like. But the, the biggest majority they've got is 5,100. So they're probably thinking we're, we're more than likely going to lose every single one of those seats coming to the next general election. So why not play this card? And it might help us save some more English seats at the expense of seats that we're probably going to lose in Scotland anyway. So what have the Tories got to lose? I think the Tories, I mean, the Tories, I don't actually genuinely think the Tories really care about yeah. Scotland. I think it's about power. It's about the fact if they can keep the SNP, it, 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 people don't realise this, but the SNP is a sea anchor on uh, Labour's chances of forming majority government. If you give 50 seats, 50 Scottish seats to the SNP, that's 50 seats that the Labour Party don't have, and, and a smattering of seats that we don't have either. Um, and, and that serves both of those parties well. And actually, though, that clash of nationalisms feeds off each other. You know, the, the SNP feed off the, the evil Tory party, but the Tory party feed off the evil nationalists, and, and they're both laughing all their way to the ballot box. And, and we need to break that up, and we need to disrupt that. And we are starting to do that. And, and, and I'll finish on this is that um, the local authority elections, I think, were the biggest sort of encouraging bellwether that that is starting to fall away. You know, we went forward, we, we put 30 percent um, seats on our councillor base um, against the odds. Um, and I think it just shows that we, we're cutting through again. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make one quick point, John, and get, get Alex's thoughts on this as well, which is obviously the basis of Nicola suggesting that she should call this referendum is the fact that, you know, again, she's announced we were pulled out of Europe against our will and we want to take Scotland back into the European Union. Now, you and I, well, all three of us were obviously ardent Remain. We wanted to see the United Kingdom remain as part of the European Union and obviously we lost that. Um, but I think what we really need to start pointing out to people is that this idea that Scotland just walks out of the UK and immediately walks into the European Union is just a fallacy. And it's it's pulling the wool over people's eyes because even, you know, the people who have researched this from an SNP side are open to admitting that this is probably a decade, if not more, before there's a chance of Scotland re-entering the European Union. Um, it'd just be good to get your thoughts on that. And really, my opinion is we've got more of a chance of returning to the EU as a member of the UK than we do as an independent state. I couldn't agree with you more, David. Absolutely. And uh, and people um, forget that actually the SNP are quite late to the Euro Europhile party. Mm -hmm. This is the same Nicola Sturgeon that was willing to take us out of Europe in 2014. If we'd voted yes, that seemed exactly what would have happened. Um, and, and threatened to deport all European citizens from um, Scotland if that was the case. And so, and, and, and another point on that is that they actually spent more money on the Shetland by-election, which Lib Dems <laughs> won, than, um, than they spent on the whole of the Remain campaign in 2016. That just shows, how, you know, the crocodile tears that the SNP have been weeping over Europe. Look, we're not going to get back into Europe if we become an independent, certainly not for a long time. Why do I say that? Well, the uh, European Union is very specific about its accession criteria. Firstly, you, the Maastricht accession criteria um, require that you have or are very close to having a, a, a structural deficit of no higher than 3%. And um, before COVID, Scotland's structural deficit was 9%. That is huge and would require massive austerity and income tax rises to pay down before we even get to the races of being considered. Secondly, there's the, the currency issue is really, really significant because right now the SNP, and I still struggle to believe that this is an actual hard and fast party policy, but their, their party policy is effectively to dollarize 
with the pound is to, to informally use the pound as our currency um, and the SM, the, the uh, European Union will not allow that. They won't allow the membership of a, a, an accession member, which doesn't have its own currency, which is trading in the currency of a non-member state, which doesn't have a central bank, doesn't have a lender of last resort, doesn't have the facility for quantitative easing, um, and and all of these things get in the way of it. But but again, the, that all that stuff is just irritating ephemera to the um, SNP. They just want to seduce the 20% of Remainers who might change their vote from no to yes, that this is somehow a lifeboat back into the EU. And it's very cynical. Uh, and and, and we've, we've talked about it several times on the podcast that people who aren't in Scotland look on at, uh, at the SNP with, with rose-tinted glasses, if I'm going to be diplomatic, with absolute delusion, if I was n- not being diplomatic. And the fact that the, the, the SNP, as we're going to talk about now, have made some horrendous mistakes and mismanagement of Scotland. And we think, all oh, because they're not Boris, that we somehow think they are they are somehow saints that are, that have been like we just don't understand and I I, I do it and in fact, I actually heard it yesterday said well if Scotland went independent I'd probably go up there is you know completely ignoring all the rest of the issues in there so David you've alluded to some of them and you I mean you we did it you did a whole thing on the, the 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 issue regarding ferries and all the rest of it up in the horrendous contracts but it's the stuff that the SNP gets away with which must infuriate Scottish Lib Dems so much. Well, look, I think, first of all, for anybody, you know, and my my fellow members who are in other parts of the UK who might look on the SNP with favourable eyes, the the SNP's mantra and how they've managed government is com- the complete antithesis to what the Liberal Democrat mantra is. I mean, we talk about disseminating power down from centralised structures to other institutions such as local government and also to people to be allowed to make effective Uh, decisions that affect their lives. The complete opposite is what the SNP have done. They've taken powers away from local government. They've taken funding away from local government. They've centralised services. You know, you look at uh, most of the, the, for instance, the police force, right? Turning that into a singular police force, in my opinion, was not good for policing in Scotland. They've done that across the board in centralising services. That's not my politics. I don't think that's the politics of the majority of people who are Liberal Democrats. And I think actually it's not served the Scottish people well. And we can see that in what Alex has talked about and you know, highest drug death rates in, in Europe. And actually, since the SNP came into power, we were making good progress on reducing that number. And it has gone in the opposite direction. So I would question where their priorities lie in government. And the reality is, is it's not actually tackling the problems of Scotland. It's about one thing and one thing only, and it's a never ending. And if I could come in on that, John, um, I think it's fair to say, and and David knows this uh, all too well, um, that with the SNP comes this kind of Scottish exceptionalism that, you know, Scottish people are just wired differently. We've got, we're more progressive, we're um, more right on. Um, And and I think that that speaks to the trick that the SNP have pulled. They are a nationalist party, don't ever forget that. But whether they're so successful, because unlike other nationalist parties around um, the world, they have dressed themselves up in the clothes of the progressive left. Um, and, and actually, but if you scratch the surface, there is a dark underbelly of xenophobia in the SNP. And I'll expand that a little bit. Um, so, for example, you know, we had uh, during the pandemic, there was a, a frisson of um, possibility that the uh, first minister was going to close the border at Gretna because of um, much higher COVID rates in England. Um, And in a heartbeat, she had 20, 30 of her wilder outriders down there holding signs at Gretna, shouting at English motorists saying, go home. You know, uh, people point to the fact that we don't vote for parties of the hard right. Well, we do actually, because at the last European election, um, we got a Brexit MEP just like everybody else. Um, But the reality is that the racists, the xenophobes exist in Scotland, but they're all just voting for the SNP because they hate the English more than they hate anybody else. And And that sounds extreme, but it is true. And I carry a personal attack alarm because the police came to see me and said, we're a bit worried about some of the anti-English hate you're getting online and it's, it's getting a bit violent, some of the, the stuff. And I, I don't see it because I'm mute to all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it just shows that, you know, it's so febrile. So the, the SNP are not benign freedom fighters. They are nationalists and they are zealots. 
Um, and they believe that the answer to all of our problems, our shared problems, can be found in a border and a flag. And I'm sorry, I just don't want part of that. Yeah, and I, I fully agree with Alice. I mean, I think some of the hate that's been directed at you that we you know, see online is, is just disgraceful. And the fact that there's no apology forthcoming from the party that the supporters are directing this at you is yeah. disgraceful. But, the you know, you just have to look at, you know, last week they have a rally in Bannockburn and you have an MSP from the SNP that's holding up a flag of a, of a group that calls themselves basically a, a hard-line ethnic nationalist Scottish party. Yeah. Uh, or Scottish of the Gale. Yes. Yeah. And then the MSP comes out and says, oh, sorry, I didn't really realise what that flag was when I was holding it up. I mean, why would you hold up a flag that you had no yeah. idea what it was? <laughs> mm. I, I, thought, I thought these guys in white pointy hats were just dressing as ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the, the utter madness. And, you know, yeah. we, we see it time and time again. And, and I think even in, you know, Glasgow, where I stood, um, you know, I don't want to get into obviously the difficulties, the subdivisions of religion in the west coast of Scotland, but the fact that certain members of the SNP prey on that and use that as a reason as to why you should support their party, I think is just disgusting and has no yeah. place in modern politics. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, guys, thank you very much. I did ask uh, people if they've ha had any questions for Alex, and one that came comes up a lot of them is a, a lot of them is people just saying, "Why don't you want the independence vote?" or something like that. But actually, we did have one from a, a Lib Dem member who lives in in England who said, "Can English Lib Dems help, or does any involvement play into nationalist hands?" So, um, well, firstly, I, I think that's. Thank you for the offer. I think that's lovely. It speaks to the values of our party that that we we help each other. And you know, I was down in North Shropshire. You guys were in Tiverton. You know, people we, we move around the country. We like to campaign as well. And I, I have I have to confess, you know, this part of me. I mean, I am elected on a cast iron mandate to oppose any referendum, no matter what. I got more votes than any candidate in the history of the Scottish Parliament to do just that, and and I will absolutely oppose it. But but I. You know, I'm being goaded by people like Lorna Sage saying, oh, you're terrified of making a, a positive case for the union because one doesn't exist. I will make a positive case for the union. I'm planning to do that in, in a roadshow of public meetings and, and we want to get into it. But yeah, at the moment, there isn't a campaign because there's not a referendum, nor will there be one. Yeah. Um, and actually, the time at which these um, issues are going to be debated in, pu in public places, you guys will have your own campaigns to fight because we will be in the teeth of a general election. So I really appreciate um, the offer. Um, uh, but, you know, um, that said, we never know. There's, there's many moving parts in this. The Supreme Court could surprise everybody. Um, and then, then hey, let's talk. But um, <laughs> but for now, there is not going to be a referendum. Nicola Sturgeon doesn't actually want a referendum because she she's pragmatic. And I don't think she would roll the dice when it was so evenly balanced. And she wants to have a commanding lead and be sure, sure of victory. There is no clarity about that. In fact, the, the polls are sliding away from her. Well, actually, Alex, just to pick up on a point you made there as well, uh, you know, where Lorna Slater says, oh, you don't want to make a positive case for the union because one doesn't exist. The reality is, is they've had since 2014 to come up with the positive case for independence. And it's not progressed beyond what the white paper said in 2014 that people soundly rejected. I mean, just yesterday I was talking about this where, you know, in 2014, I got laughed out of Greenock Town Hall for asking questions about, the encroachment of Russian aircraft Tupolev bombers into Scottish uh, airspace. You know, what would an independent Scotland do? Where's our air force? What model of fighter would we have to intercept these? And people went, oh, Russia's not a threat, you idiot, blah, blah, blah. Well, those people aren't laughing now. And that same yeah. question remains. And none of these questions have been answered. A couple of points on that, David. I've, and this actually came up on the doors quite a lot in the council elections. We're meeting former Nats who were saying, um, well, I thought I wanted independence, but with Russia, I'm a bit, I'm not so sure now's the time to do that, or now's the time to step out from under the nuclear umbrella or or whatever. And, and I have my own views on nuclear weapons, but but that was something that was was coming out hard and fast. Uh, but also I think that um the problem with that is actually coming up with an answer to all these key questions like currency, border at Carlisle, um, the route into the EU, membership of NATO. Uh, all these are very specific, have very specific answers. Some of them are yes or no. Some of them are the pound or the euro or whatever. Um, but as soon as you start answering questions, you start offending parts of the independence base. Why? Because independence is this amorphic dream. This it's, it's like a big present wrapped up under the Christmas tree. 
and and you can just imagine what's in it and it and and as for as long as it's not unwrapped it is what you want it to be but answering these questions is peeling back some of the christmas wrapping paper and actually seeing what's underneath it and it's up to, upsetting to to certain groups that's why the smp have never answered these questions because for as long as they don't have to answer them they can keep everybody on the bus because it's whatever you want it to be it's yes we'll have increased pensions yes it's being member of efta or the eu whatever you want it to be we're not going to pull the trigger on that um, or it's going to be a republic or we're going to retain the monarchy and it's the same playbook the brexiteers used what does brexit exactly. actually mean it, oh no we're definitely not going to leave the single market or yeah. the customs union oh yeah. no we're going to leave everything we're going to just be we're going to cut off the entire you know if, if you don't if you're not specific you can appeal to a wider audience but the problem is it generally leads to problems later which we're now seeing with with, with the northern ireland protocol and everything else and and, uh, and and a lot of now conservatives coming back saying actually do we want to rejoin the single market so if you are not specific it might be great for a campaign but it's rubbish for governance and i think that's the problem um no but is there any other points you guys want to make before we wrap up? But I, I do want to say just very quickly, because uh, there are no elections in Scotland uh, this year coming and Lancashire's beautiful in May and a certain podcast host is up uh, in his council seat. So any of you want to come down to Lancashire for a quick John, moment, I think be, uh, we've discussed more than it before. I grew up in Lancashire. So, um, well, we knew I you were a good one. That's yeah. just, uh, that's just... <laughs> I, I grew up in a place called Bickerstaff near Ormskirk. Yeah, um, that's right. So, um, yeah, no. Do you know what? You won't have to ask too hard because I I get scratchy if I've not been fighting an election between, after a certain period of time. So you can we'll, we'll get Carlo down to help you. Although, guys. Uh, or the way that the 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 Tories are losing MPs and getting scandals, we're, we're having by elections just about every other month now. Anyway, including and uh, maybe even your patch, David. You know, in the Midlands. Uh, well, yeah, obviously the, uh, the the Tory whip has um, has had to resign from obviously sexual assault allegations, and he, he, he's the MP for Tamworth, uh, mm -hmm. and that's down the road. So, who knows what might be coming? But um, I think there's also isn't there also potentially one coming for um, sorry, his, his name's gone right out of my head, but the one that was caught in a picture doing lines of yeah. cocaine in, in, in Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, and that if any members want, because any of you who missed Tiverton and Honiton, I always love elections because they kind of they refill your Lib Dem cup they may get you energized again although it is down south again we realize that but Summerton and Froome uh, we've already selected a candidate there's already a virtual HQ on Facebook do start thinking oh if I had a week can because they're already starting to work on that Lib Dems are in a good second place there already compared to Tiverton and Honiton it's much more likely we'd get a good result there but as Tiverton Haunton, it's all down to how many of us can get down there. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. But no, but thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, David, for our little update on Scottish politics. No doubt we will we will return to it many times over the next as we start ramping up to the general election. And also we'll be talking to some of the key Scottish candidates coming up to the general election. And we do know Eastern Bartonshire has been selected. That is yeah. obviously one of the key seats. I think it's our number one. Uh, seat in terms of uh, needing to overturn yeah, was it yeah. 148 something like that Absolutely. yeah so and, and and if if the SMB want to make um the general election all about independence then that's grist to our mill and um you know tactical voting will become significant significantly help us in places like eastern Barnshire. so but at the end of the day um i'm less interested in the electoral fortunes of our party much as i want them to be good and to improve as i am on a government that's actually focused on reducing mental health weights and the worst drug deaths in the world you know this is this is why i got into politics is to change things for people who are struggling and at the at the moment they are being absolutely let down by manifest ministerial disinterest in the SNP because the only thing they want is the breakup of the UK and with that we will end today's episode so thank you everyone uh, for watching and listening thank you very much Alex and Dave for coming on we'll have loads more episodes coming up because politics seems to be febrile at the moment shall we say <laughs> so and uh, you never know by the time this comes out will boris be leader will he not who knows right oh there you go alex we've asked everyone so far we haven't asked you will boris be leader at christmas at christmas um yes i think he will because i think it's recess will take the heat out of things for him um i think that there's quite a few things that need to happen before um, the Tories can get rid of him. He's not going anywhere himself. I think that what what's likely to happen is the the 22 committee will change the rules so they can have another vote. But that in itself will probably take a few months. Um, and then, yeah, not not long after Christmas. I don't think he'll wait, last the full year before he can survive another vote. 
There we go. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And we'll be back with another episode very soon.